So today we're going to talk about uh, 10 lessons learned in search projects the past 10 years. I'm uh, Yetro. I'm going to do this with my colleague Barin. Uh, as we have a tight schedule, we will not take too much time to introduce ourselves. Um, so 10 years of search. It's a lot of uh, a lot of time. Um, I still remember the first project that we did together about 10 years ago. Um, we were well educated in uh, in uh, Elasticsearch. We knew how to install it. We knew how to configure it. We knew how to talk to it. We knew how to write queries. So we were ready for customers, and we were ready to help customers. Uh, so the first customer we we went to started asking questions, and then he was asking questions about BM25, and he started uh, asking questions about problems with uh, stemming and stop words that you could lose words even if you did it in the right in the wrong combination. And Byron and myself were there and we started looking at each other like, oh man, we still got a lot to learn. And well, we're now 10 years further. Uh, we've gained a lot of experience. We know a lot more about search these days, but we're still learning. And I think that's uh, very important in the search domain that you keep on learning, keep on improving and uh, keep on giving better uh, experience to the search users. Let's start. So. Another customer that I uh, I was at, I, I was uh, called to to help them improve their search solution, and uh, well, it, it took me a few weeks to to go through it uh, thoroughly, and I uh, prepared a nice presentation for the management team. I uh, of course it was not as technical as you see in this slide with all the formulas, but it was a kind of a technical presentation where I I created a roadmap what we should do and how we could improve. So I, I put my, my laptop at the screen and um, I, I wanted to start talking and immediately the manager took the word and he said, well, search is really bad. Well, he did use a little bit other words that I'm not going to repeat here, but um, I couldn't even start my presentation and he was uh, showing on the website why search was bad and I almost felt like that was it. So that was what I had to do. So when you recognize this, maybe in this case, no one cares enough about search could be wrong because he, he cared enough to hire me and to tell me that he thought it was very bad, but it, they don't really care enough about uh, improving it together and, and to uh, learn about how to improve it. There's not really like a business plan in uh, available and in how to improve search and why and the amount of budget that is needed and those kind of things. And there's also nobody responsible for search in a management team. Usually they just see it as a sort of a technical problem and that's it. So if you're in this situation, the result is usually that the customer just tells you that search is bad and you just need to fix it. Well, the solution to this, to this thing is that before you actually start analyzing the search solution, you need to prepare the management and the, the other involved people of the company for the search challenge that they're going to take. You have to come with a sort of a, a common understanding of what the search problem is. And you have to explain that improving search is a journey and not just a singular, a single event that when it's done, it's done. You need to keep improving and you need to keep doing it together. One thing that we learned is that you uh, can execute sort of a maturity scan and uh, the result of this scan is usually a roadmap in which steps you're going to improve search for the customer. So the first lesson is that you need a business driver to succeed with your search challenge. Without the business involvement and without a clear goal together with the business, it's going to be hard to get a very good search experience. As Jethro just explained, uh, search needs a business driver in order to become a success. But the only way you can help a business uh, figure out and where to steer that direction is when you uh, give them some data to act on or analytics. So what happens if you don't have analytics? Uh, if we do the next slide. Then improvements are made without clear goals and nobody really has a clue what you're improving, uh, whether you're improving sales or customer experience at all. Now, a lot of times business has one KPI, uh, mostly conversion rate, uh, which is a good thing to act on as a KPI, but there are multiple KPIs that you can actually look at uh, and monitor and create reports for. So if we check the next slide, then what we recommend is actually from the start, start creating some reports and uh, note down some KPIs that you want to monitor and keep in track. 
For instance, zero results is the most obvious one uh, because it really points out what terms users are searching, but then end up with an empty page, meaning that you either have something missing in your uh, matching setup or you're just missing content, which you can act on by getting that content. Uh, zero conversion is an interesting one uh, that uh, you actually have all the search terms that people get products for, but then next up, they don't buy anything, meaning that there could be something uh, wrong with the, amount, with the type of products that you're returning. Then we have often found but never clicked and often clicked but never bought, which actually could tell you something about those kind of products uh, that people are looking for but not actually converting with. But I think the most important part of these kind of analytics is that you start with them early, create reports so it's visible by everyone uh, who's working on this search solution to come up with ways on how to improve the um, search in the future. And the most important part is to uh, involve business with that. So I think that really the second lesson is really to start and discuss analytics like straight from the beginning and involve everyone uh, that has something to do with the whole search. All right. So now we got analytics fixed. Um, analytics gives a really nice overview of where you're standing at the moment. So you monitor your uh, uh, live performance and see where people have issues. But we know that search is like an evolving system where we want to make changes and make improvements. And normally what you would do when you want to make improvements uh, to your setup is you think of an idea of something that could improve your relevancy or could improve or add extra features. Um, but uh, normally you start with an hypothesis, uh, you implement uh, your change, you run an A-B test for two weeks and you get results back and they're negative. Back to the drawing board. Uh, we can have the next slide. So the symptom would be that you make changes, but those in changes in the end don't expect, uh, yield the same results as you expected. So you don't have a positive outcome. The downside of that is that your release cycle is slow because you have to go back to the drawing board, think of a new idea, and start the whole phase over again with a B testing. So you don't really know up front before you put the test live uh, whether you're going to have a good result. So what we uh, normally start with when we go to a new customer or we start helping out an existing customer is start with a judgment list. And a judgment list is a list of judgments where judgment is a relevancy mapping between a product and a search term. Uh, you can boil it down to a question. Is this product relevant for this search term? So we can make these judgments by looking, for instance, at our top owner queries. And we have some regression uh, queries that we know are sometimes a bit iffy uh, within this engine. Uh, and we go over the result page and we go through each product and say, yes, I think this product is relevant or this product is irrelevant for a certain query. Now, this judgment list allows you to do a couple of things. Uh, one of them is start um, with uh, offline testing, where um, you can uh, run a test and compare two versions and see if your search is actually improving. Um, for instance, if we go to the next slide, then what you see here is our eShop that we built with Luminous. And on the left side, you can see three product rows. And on the right side, you see three product rows. Now, each row um, uh, is a part of a different engine. So on the right side, we improve the query by adding fuzziness. Um, and now we can use our judgments, the green and row underlines under each product, um, which defines, is this product relevant, yes or no? Now, if we compare the metrics on top, then we see that on the right side, precision is lower on, than on the left side, and we get more hits. So we could actually learn that the change that we did, adding fuzziness, is not, not a positive effect. So we don't even have to do an A-B test. Now, this makes us, uh, our release cycle a lot shorter. So if we can go to the next, then the lesson would be if you start with these judgment lists up front uh, and maintain them and keep evolving them, uh, you can use them to do more offline testing and, and make sure that your changes actually are verified before you put them live. Okay, when I, uh, usually when I come at a new customer, especially if it's a customer where I will be for a longer period of time, the first thing I check is uh, where is the coffee and how is the coffee? Because coffee is important to me. Um, well, very, very common is that you have a very bad input for the coffee machine, which is instant coffee. And if you're lucky and there are beans as input for the coffee, then still the machine doesn't always make it good coffee. Well, with search, it's not really different. With search, if you have bad content that comes into your search machine, your search solution, 
then it's very hard to also create good results to your users. So if you have bad content, the problem is that your users most likely will not find what they're looking for. And you have to do very advanced things in your queries and they have to be very large and very uh, and a lot of exceptions to at least make them work and give some relevant content to your users. Of course, there is a solution to that. And that is improving your content. There's a number of ways that you can improve your content. Uh, first is, for instance, adding domain knowledge. So if you know uh, the categories of your system and you can recognize them in the content, you can make them very explicit. Um, maybe there is a, uh, a mismatch in the, um, the categories from your supplier and that you have, so be very thorough into determining that categories and add them to your content. It could also be that your supplier uh, delivers you items that you don't even want to sell. Of course, you could add a flag to the item and then filter it in your query, but it's even better not to import them at all. Another thing that is very good habit to do is to learn from bad performing content. Byron already talked about analytics that you can use, like items that were found but never clicked and items that were clicked but never bought. These are indications that there is something wrong with your content. It could be that there is too many search terms in the content that people try to get in to be always in the result list. So then it doesn't say anything about the product. It's just a matching thing. It could also be that it's lacking a lot of terms. Uh, why, why And therefore, it's, it's not really clicked because maybe there is no picture in there or the name is very strange and you can learn a lot from this content as well by just looking at analytics. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you see these errors and this content are coming for your suppliers, you can fix them yourself, but it's even better to ask them to fix it because then you have less energy to put into it and they can really think about their own content and help you in getting their products better into your search engine. This is an example that I have on a Dutch website. So the search terms are in Dutch. And why uh, did I take a Dutch example? Well, one, because I'm Dutch. But the other reason is that in, the, in Holland, we use compound words a lot. So if you look at aftershave, it's not very strange to put it in as two words or to use it as one word. But in this search engine, you see that they give back uh, different results. So if you uh, write them down as two words, then you get 37 matching products. And if you write them down as one word, you have over 70 hits and they are completely different products. Well, most likely this is not the experience that you want to give to your user. So by improving the content and picking one of these two categories in your content, then most likely you will get better results to your customers. So the lesson in this case is that you have to be in control of your content process. If you're not in control, you will lose the results in your queries and in the end you will lose your customer. But of course, there's more to it. I mean, even if your content is great, then still you can have an engine that doesn't work at all. And these days there are a lot of engines that you can use, some open source, some closed source, and they come with all these nice bells and whistles that you can use, and they all promise you the easiest way out to get the best experience for your user. But it's not always the case. I, I have a, a number of customers where they were using a machine learned model to give back results to all the users. And the, the trend for these, these solutions was that there were very strange results getting back to the users. So it wasn't really a textual match, but the, the, the trained model thought that by entering a certain term that people would most likely like that thing as well. I'm not saying that uh, artificial intelligence or, or machine learning is wrong in the search area. I think it's, it's getting there and it's used, being used a lot these days, but you have to be very careful to start out with this trained model before you understand what your search is doing and how your users are behaving. So the symptom here would be that fancy options don't always improve search results. And it could be that users see strange hits, maybe no results at all, or they see no results when they would expect them. And this could all be by mistuning your search engine. So the solution to this would be 
that you should not trust out of the box configurations. So you can look at these bells and whistles. Of course, you should look at stemming, but in different languages, the results of the stemming are quite different. And the default out of the box stemming could be worse than, for instance, using Huntspell expansions and, and try to add words yourself if you see that a lot in the analytics. You also have to be careful with stop words, uh, just like I mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, where misconfiguring stop words could even cause not using the specific words that you should definitely use in your query. Another thing to think about is using synonyms. Synonyms are misused a lot to make everything work that doesn't work. But the, the tricky bit is that you turn out to have like hundred thousands of synonyms. Nobody understands them anymore. And nobody dares changing them because they don't know the effect. And the last one I want to stress out here is the use of engrams. Engrams are used quite a lot as well. And of course, they, they can be handy. But the tricky bit with engrams could be that you have a lot of matches again, if you make them small enough, that almost everything matches. And it's not, not hard to give as many matches as you need. But then what is your relevance of these matches? This can become a lot harder when using uh, all the boosting options that you have in your environment or in your engine. So this was one of the examples of a customer that we had, where on the left side, you see the old situation. And on the right side, you see the optimized that is now in production. On the left side, where we were looking for M&Ms, the M percent was taken out by the standard analyzer. And suddenly, when looking for M&Ms, we see X. Well, apparently some customers thought it was a good idea, but we know from the analytics that these eggs were actually bought sometimes, but whether that's a good search behavior, well, that's questionable. On the right-hand side, you see that we did something different in the analyzers, and now the search engine is a lot better tuned, and now you actually see all M&M products in there, even M&M peanut butter. So the lesson here would be, that, of course, you can use advanced features, but you should use them to your own advantage and not just because you can. All right. <clears throat> I think over the last few years, the question that I received the most uh, when consulting at a company was, why is this product above this product? Or why is this product not there because I expected it there? And it actually boils down to one of the problems that happens a lot. Uh, the next slide is that it's really hard to understand why certain results pop up. And that is not just for developers or people that are working directly on the system, but these questions also pop up from other people inside the company that are actually maybe maintaining a category or uh, that are product managers. They will want to know why certain products are not in the spot that they expect them to be. So not knowing how this comes makes it really hard to explain these matching results and also there's no really easy way of checking in which order uh, products are or how they come that that order has been made up. So what we'd like to do uh, actually almost on every project that we go to uh, is to use or create the right tooling in order to help us get this information. Now, maybe some of you has been to the workshop yesterday from Eric, Johannes, Paul, and Rene uh, about towards an open tool source deck for e-commerce. Um, the tools prescribed there is something that we could also use, but mostly we check with clients um, what their purpose for need is. So it could be that they uh, that we could use the open source tooling, but sometimes it's not possible, and then we will create our own tooling uh, around that. And what it allows you to do is to really dig into your uh, essentials of how your search engine is working and help figure out why certain things work as they work. Um, the most important part is that if you create these insights, you can start sharing them with non-technical people as well, meaning that they won't have to come to you every time to ask, why uh, am I not seeing my product or why is this product here at all? Um, one of the uh, steps you could take after that is after opening that up uh, is create these kind of screens, which gives this explanation and maybe even give control to the non-technical people to influence these kind of things. So for instance, here on the left side, you see a breakdown of the first three products that are returned for the search term coffee table. And the blue bars actually explain why the match or why the ranking is um, what it is. So which terms have matched, if it was matched because of a synonym, uh, and so on and so on. And on the right side, we see uh, what happens to our search term uh, when, we, uh, uh, when we analyze it. So how does our analysis chain work? Uh, this will really help to figure out, OK, if I search this term, 
why is it matched? Is it matched because of the synonym? Uh, or is it because, uh, for instance, on the left side of the analysis chain, you see at the end that we uh, combine the coffee table word into one term uh, because we have a lot of these compound issues that uh, Yetro already shared before. So I think the key takeaway from this um, is that you should open up search as fast as possible to non-technical people because it really helps create that mutual understanding of how the engine works and it really helps other people to come up with ideas to even improve um, and make the whole solution better. All right. I'm not sure if some of you, most of you will maybe uh, know this image. This was an image from two weeks ago, uh, the historic launch of the Crew Dragon uh, missile uh, that delivered our, um, astronauts to the ISS two weeks ago. And you might be wondering, what does this have to do with search? Uh, but we actually use missiles uh, as an analogy when we're talking about search. Because the problem we're seeing a lot uh, is that a lot of people try to uh, build their engine with one big query. So if we have that next slide. Um, so a lot of people that start out with search uh, try to do everything in one query. They want to do full matching. They want to have partial matching. Uh, they add some fuzziness in case uh, someone makes a typo. Um, but the downside of these approaches is that you, for instance, for the fuzzy part, uh, also get really irrelevant products back uh, in your normal search. So coming back to the uh, spacecraft, we like to break this up by doing multiple step queries. And now you don't always have uh, the ability to do this because maybe you have search that comes with a solution that you're using, uh, which means that you don't have any uh, personal control over it. Um, so that could be a, a hard thing to start with. Another thing about this big query that it's really hard to tune, uh, especially when it comes to ranking, because you have so many tiny components that actually handle how search is working. Uh, and of course, it's really hard later to add stuff on top of that if it's already one really big monster. So what we generally recommend, uh, if possible, create a wrapper search service around your search engine, which allows you to intercept and adjust search terms before executing them. You can add your own, own logic on top uh, extract entities and categories, uh, start enabling A-B tests, and the logging of your search and responses so you can use that later on to see how people are actually using your system. So, for instance, uh, as an example, uh, this site is something we use uh, for looking up images for, for our presentation, and we noticed actually that we made a typo while, while searching for some, some images. And you see that there are no results. Now, no one is really helped by an empty result page. But you could say uh, what some what this company could have done is actually take this multi-step approach and say, okay, first we're going to try and match everything there is, like they do now. But in case there are zero results, fall back to either partial matching or fuzzy matching or sw uh, swapping an operator around, which would still get results and would still allow the customer to actually find maybe the product that they were looking for. So. Lesson would be is to use multiple queries through a service wrapper because it allows you to have this fine-grained ability to uh, have more control over what you're executing and what you're returning to a user. All right. So I think in any case, it would be the most ideal shopping experience you could have. You don't have to leave your house. You turn on TV. You talk to someone. You say, I want to have a pair of pants. Now, asking for a pair of pants is pretty generic and pretty broad, could be any pants. So the person across from you would ask, what kind of pants? For what occasion? You start a conversation. And I think that is something we're not doing enough within search right now. And it's really something we should strive for to create this online experience as if you're having a conversation with someone in a store that's helping you out to find your uh, the product you're looking for. So we just talked about creating the server wrapper for doing uh, a lot of back-end stuff, which is more in the background. But now we have to think about the front-end, about the user experience. And we see a lot that a lot of companies are not really helping their users in trying to formulate their query. So what are you exactly looking for? In the case of pens, if I search for pens, then there is no, no one asking me what occasion do you need it for? Um, where do you want to, um, what kind of color do you want? Mostly, it's up to the user to go and find the products they're looking for. But it could be that customers don't find the product. So they keep trying. They keep endlessly browsing for their products. And in the end, they don't find it and leave. So what you want to do is you want to start as early as possible by thinking of ways to help your user uh, formulate their query. 
So the solution would be to find new ways. And the first step would be offer filters. Like search is more than a search bar. Um, if you give users filters, they know how they work. They can actually drop, uh, drop down and find more fine grain, narrow down what they're looking for. But the next thing would be start a conversation. There to ask people in a way uh, that fits within your user experience to help them narrow down their requests. And even think about other interactions. Because right now, the world, uh, more and more people are doing online uh, searches, and e-commerce is getting bigger, especially in these times. So find a way to engage with your user. And one example of that is um, a company in the Netherlands um, that, for instance, on the left side, if you search for LG OLED, uh, it already shows you products. It gives you product recommendations. Uh, it gives suggestions on the search term. But at the bottom, it actually says, compare this TV with this TV. So it already knows uh, that these are the most common TVs that people are thinking about and already giving an option to fulfill my information need of which one should I choose. And on the right side, we see, for instance, uh, a pop-up model that uh, got opened when you click on the information button next to a facet. And what this does, it explains what the facet is, what options it gives, and it helps you narrow down um, your searches for, instance, uh, it's a screen diagonal, uh, which diagonal is good for your house. So these are questions you would get answered when you're in the store. And I think it's something you should really try for to doing that as well in your online experience. So guide eight would be uh, lesson eight would be guide your users to what they are looking for, uh, either by the conventional methods or think about new ways to interact with your users. Yeah, so Byron, Byron was already uh, talking about shopping experience, and it happens to be that uh, well, during my study, I was working in a record store, and um, well, of course, we luckily had customers back then. And they would come to the counter and start asking questions. Well, these questions could be very diverse. It could be like, uh, give me a city that has a, is a rock. Or it could be a city in which they said, well, give me a city from the Beatles. If, it, if it's like one of these two, then you think, OK, um, I'll, I'm not that old that the Beatles had only one city. So there were multiple. So what would they actually be looking for? So then I would generally walk with them, walk to the place where the CDs of all the Beatles are, and just just show them mm -hmm. and ask if they can find what, they, what they're looking for, if they have additional information, if they need other answers. But it's a quite different experience from someone that comes in, tells me, I want to have the CD of U2 called Rattle and Hum. Well, then I know exactly what he wants. I can just pick it, and he pays for it, and it's his, and he's gone. So these are two quite different experiences where in the first experience someone is actually getting inspired he, he wants to, to learn more about what he needs he wants to give a little bit more information maybe he doesn't really know what but we can help him and in the other scenario he just knows what he wants and he wants to buy it and he wants to be gone the symptom in a lot of uh, e-commerce websites and other websites is that all searches are treated the same so it doesn't really matter if you're doing a very broad term or if you're going for a very specific kind of query. And of course, there is a solution to that as well. But first, we need to recognize whether a, a query is actually a browse or a, or a broad query or a very specific query. One way to do that is to compare the query, for instance, to a category tree, because we see that if people type in very broad terms that they usually resemble one of the categories that we sell. Uh, it could be that it's one of the main categories that has a lot of subcategories. And then we can try to ask the user if he might be uh, searching for one of these subcategories and then point it to, well, for more specific results. Another way is to just gather information about all the results that you get check the categories that all these products or, or, or items are in, and then calculate some entropy value. If this entropy is constant among a lot of categories, then it's most likely a broad search that they're doing. Because you don't know really in what category the product is, then most likely it's a broad search. And then you can present, again, a different experience where the user is just challenged in, in uh, giving more information about what he's actually looking for. If the entropy value is very high in just one or two categories, then the chances are big that it's much more a specific search. And then you can just dive into those categories 
and, and present uh, with a very specific results to the user. So the trick here is that you need to have more contact from the users. So you could show them obvious categories that, that might match his, his query. Um, but we also saw in, in the, the, the cool blue case that if you start typing, that we could already say like, ah, maybe you're searching for this term in this category. And then users don't even have to go to the search engine. They already immediately in the interface can tell you what they're actually looking for. And a final solution that I want to point out is to diversify results. And um, the, the, the trick here is that if you know that the search returns multiple categories, that you, do, that you implicitly show the top result from each category. So you don't really focus on one or just the top results because it's hard to think about top results if the terms are very broad. An example that I wanted to show is from the Nike web shop where you search for shoes. It, this is what you get presented. It's mostly soccer shoes, but you're not really inspired to give more information that you're actually looking for a completely different kind of shoe. Of course, there are filters on the left side, but then you have to have to look at it yourself and it, it would be easier to just have some form of tiles here where you could get more specific information and help and guide these user to a different uh, experience so this lesson is that you have to give browsers and searches a good experience don't try to treat them as one because they are different and, and most likely they are looking for a different experience. Uh, and it's not, not that hard to accomplish this if you know what you're doing. So we're already at the final lesson. And in this lesson, um, I want to point out that, that we discussed quite some lessons that were not technical. I mean, we talked about the business. We talked about the content. We talked about analytics. We talked about user experience and we talked about technology. This is intentional. I mean, the reason is that it's very, very important that you get these disciplines in, make them work together as one team. But if they work as a team, then the chances are the biggest that you will get the experience that you're looking for with the right performance, with impact on the business, so that in the end you will have a prosperous company. The symptom is that search is treated as a technical problem that you just fix once. I mean, with the customer that I talked about before, he couldn't really understand that it wasn't only the search engine that needed an upgrade. I mean, it was the whole process. It was that they needed to think about analytics. And the whole organization needs to understand the importance of search for sales, for instance. And maybe it's not important at all. And then if you learn from the analytics, then maybe you shouldn't have search at all, which could also be a solution. But often the tech guys get to say everything in this case. They are just being told, give me a search. They implement a search and then they leave it like that. And if they have some time less, maybe they upgrade it. But that's about it. Usually the users will leave because the experience is not what they're looking for. The solution in this case would be to create a team, make the business involved by together forming KPIs, reporting about these KPIs, and be honest that if you have this nice cool feature and you test it and it shows up to be less uh, working uh, worse than it was before, then just throw it away again and try something else. And it's very important to include the user experience guys in this part as well because you want to please your users. And without a good user experience, you can show the results that you that you can, but they will still leave because they don't like the experience at all. And you have to monitor the analytics to understand your users. Without understanding your users, then yeah, you can still try to create the best engine that you think, but still, if nobody likes it, then you still have the problem. And the final bit here is that you need to keep improving search by learning from your users and you have to keep improving. So it's not a one a one-time fix. It's something that you have to do and keep on doing. So the lesson here would be to create a dedicated multidisciplinary team to solve your search challenge.
So we have about three minutes left, I think, Byron. So wrap it up, and then we can go ah. to the questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is the overview of the 10 lessons that we just gave. If you would have asked me 10 years ago if this would be the list that I would come up here with 10 years later, I would have thought you were weird because I would have thought it was purely mainly technical list. Uh, but over the years, you start to really learn that, that yeah, it's a multidisciplinary effort that you need to take. Um, so I really wonder how this list will look like in 10 years from now. So yeah, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? Back to you, Charlie. <laughs> Hi, fantastic. Thank you so much for your talk, guys. Uh, I must admit my neck is aching somewhat because I was nodding so much all the way through your talk. <laughs> so if you have the same mind, any of those, uh, with any of your, your 10 questions. So, yes, we do have some questions uh, from the Slack. Um, uh, well, actually, a point here. I mean, I'm going to start here with uh, Dominic's point, uh, who found that it could be dangerous to turn too many zero results queries into fuzzy or relaxed queries. Um, Perhaps you've got something to say about you know, the sweet spot for this kind of query relaxation. Yeah, I think I can answer that. Uh, I think it really depends, uh, which is the most common answer to everything, of course. Uh, I, I think it really depends on your use case. Uh, I think I saw in the comment that it said, like, you don't want to give your users the impression that you always have an answer to everything. And I, I really feel that. Um, so I'm, I'm not a big fan of fuzzy queries, but I think you can try and fix the most fuzziest term and fix that one specific and instead of opening up pandora's box by saying okay we're going to look through everything fuzzy so there is also in there like a multi-step approach you could do by not just turning on fuzzy as a whole uh but for certain cases try and fix that fuzziness on a small level first um so yeah that answers the question yeah and it could also well be that you just make your 404 page a bit richer by explaining to them that you don't understand what they're looking for, but just give them options to to enhance their query or do something else. Maybe give them some like top searches or or most most bought items or whatever. But it's uh, and it's something that you can test using analytics. Fantastic, thank you. So our next question, um, uh, Avi Rappaport is uh, Rappaport asks um, uh, online reference interviews. I didn't spot that in your talk. Um, but she says they've been tried unsuccessfully for decades, but maybe with an agent. I'm not sure I quite understand the question, Abby. Do, do guys, do you? Yeah, well, I, I may, maybe, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, if, if you're looking into the direction of uh, evaluating uh, search interfaces with, with tools, um, maybe looking at people using your product of course those kind of things i'm not sure if that's the way but yeah definitely that's being used as well but it's more for the user experience i think i think it's less used for the relevance okay okay uh, let, let's move on uh zenit asks uh wouldn't using the entropy of results to recognize a broad query tell that your results are chaotic rather than the query intent being broad how reliable would this be as a metric <laughs> Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I was I was re, um, hesitant to say, Byron, you can have this one, but <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, could I say 404? I don't really have a, an answer to this one. Uh, I think, but but I agree. I mean, it's uh, of course it's tricky. Uh, I think again, you have to be careful. But um, I, I also think that you have to be a bit sure when, when you're doing a user experience where you're directing people to a certain area that you have to be quite sure about it. And if you're in, if you're in doubt, then just give them the results and they figure it out themselves. Or maybe do both. Maybe just show them the results, but also give them ways to, to fine tune uh, their query. But I agree, it could be, uh, it could be tricky to do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Andy actually asks, Andy Webb asks, um, how do you actually calculate this category entry? <laughs> well, the, the easy way is, is by just uh, counting them and, uh, and doing sort of uh, an average. So if you have, uh, on, on average, uh, you, you have a category with, uh, for instance, a thousand products and you have a category with a hundred products then uh, the moment that you get back results and there are 10 from the thousand and one from the hundreds, then they're kind of similar. 
so it's it's in in relation to the amount of products that you have in the category, you just check the amount of products that come out of that category. Yeah. Okay. And then you compare the numbers. Yeah. That's Fantastic. the easy way. Okay. Um, and our last question from Carlos. Uh, how much do you think that phonetics uh, can help solve zero results? I mean, you can solve search you know, uh, issues where you can't spell uh, the query, but can it help with zero results? Yeah, I think sometimes it could help because it allows you to find typos that you wouldn't have found if you were not using fuzzy. So I think it gives another way of matching with some cases where it actually works well. Uh, but I've done some uh, research on that in the past and on some big e-commerce clients. And I think the downside of e-commerce is that you only search with one term or two terms and max three, uh, unless you're really specific into what you're looking for. And it could happen that if you have mixed language content, that the phonetics is like you really need to set it up well. And it's not a guarantee of fixing these, these zero results or improving ranking. So I think it can be hard. I think there was a talk yesterday that uh, that shed more light on better experiences that you could do without uh, phonetic. So I've never seen the real use case of phonetic in e-commerce just yet. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to squeeze one more question in uh, from Tito. Hey, Tito, uh, what search analytics metrics or KPIs do you prefer to assess search engine quality on an ongoing basis? Yeah, I think okay. it's, I think the, a few of them we mentioned, the zero results, of course, but uh, that they're just uh, a good, I, I like the the one with the zero conversion, because the zero conversion is, of course, in e-commerce land, it's, it's always about conversion. Everything is about conversion. And But what makes it interesting is that we actually found some queries that were just giving around like 10, 15, 20, sometimes even 100 results that were just because we didn't understand that there was like a metadata in there somewhere that just by coincidence resembles the query, but it doesn't have anything to do with it. And then we didn't find them with the zero results, but uh, using the zero conversion, we did find them. Yeah, yeah. especially if you just start creating your matching and you start to evaluate a new version of your engine, the zero conversion really finds that blind spots that you forgot while setting up your, uh, setting up your engine. So it's a really nice one to look at. Fantastic. Um, we've got another couple of questions. I'm afraid I'm going to have to refer you to the breakout room, uh, which will be running after the talk, because we have another talk coming up soon for America Lesson. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Yetro and Byron for your uh, fascinating and, and talk. Uh, again, very much agree with everything you said. Um, I hope that's cool. a good thing. Um, and thanks again, chaps. And I'm sure the guys will be around uh, for the rest of the day to help answer any more questions you have. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you. Bye.